Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we've got another solo album review. The full-length debut album from Ethel Kane, Preacher's Daughter. I want to walk you all through my initial experience with Ethel Kane. And yeah, it is to make a point at my own expense, but also because it highlights an issue when certain folks make reckless comparisons on their platform without the benefit of proper context. So, like a lot of folks, I started hearing a lot of promising critical buzz about Ethel Kane this year. I had heard in passing her name tied to a couple EPs, but this was her full-length debut album, a 75-minute behemoth of a release. But that's actually only a half-truth. I actually heard the most about her amidst a small social media firestorm when she openly scoffed at the coverage of a certain outlet, sketching a lot of comparisons to Lana Del Rey. Now, I saw that review, and given a healthy skepticism to the whole situation, didn't really take it at face value. I've seen the critic in question put out worse over the decades on that masthead. But when I listened to her first couple EPs, I did initially grasp where the Lana Del Rey comparison seemed to make sense. Maybe in parallels to ultraviolence, swallowed up in smoky reverb, husky vocals, certain melodic progressions pulling from vintage Americana for some dramatic recontextual and the occasional smattering of some hip-hop-inspired production, especially in the drum machines. But by the time I got to 2021's Inbred, that was a comparison that really stopped making sense altogether. It became a lot more obvious that Ethel Kane's sonic influences were considerably darker. The ragged country touches felt homespun rather than appropriated. I had almost say closer to dream country, a texture amplified in the mix rooted more in dream pop and slow core. There was this quaking, unstable bleakness far closer to Chelsea Wolfe or Grouper, where if this album was touching Americana, it wasn't Lana Del Rey's exasperated but teasing flirtation, but the sort of brutal deconstruction that felt far closer to some's reality and did not play coy with conservative power structures. Hell, even the hip-hop touches felt different. Less the glamour of an ASAP Rocky, more backwash, or any of the trap metal side of what's left of the SoundCloud scene, which places her influences a lot younger. And while it feels already cliche to call this Southern Gothic, make the lingua ignota comparison, especially given just how much American evangelicalism and fundamentalism hung over inbred, the ragged energy just felt kind of different. Younger, less studied, more queer, but more rootsy as well. And it was something special. I actually really liked that EP. Now, there were some problems with Inbred. The production definitely showed its rough edges, and the pacing of Slowcore is really something I need to be in the right mood to properly enjoy. But fuck, that was true of about every artist I just mentioned and compared Ethel Kane to, and the leap in songwriting was enough to get me properly excited about this debut, which reportedly was going to be a little less visceral, but also would showcase a greater breadth of sounds. Probably the smart choice if your debut album is seven. 75 minutes. You need some variety. Now, all that is context as to why I didn't get to this earlier, and a signifier that certain critics should be sharper with any comparisons they make, especially from a masthead, but I was encouraged to hear this. What did we get? Well, uh, we got one of the best albums of 2022. The sort of titanic debut that all at once feels brutal and bleak, but also yearning and incredibly romantic in a way that'll be distinctly uncomfortable for so many audiences. Also, I don't often put content warnings in my album reviews, but if there's one where it's appropriate for extreme violence of both the sexual and non-sexual varieties, where it is more visceral than damn near any metal album I've heard in recent memory, it's for Preacher's Daughter. Yeah, Ethel Kane is going all the way there, where the Lingua Ignota comparisons are absolutely valid, and if you're alienated by her music, this arguably goes just as far, but she also made it a grand generational epic where it's only one part of a three-album trilogy, and I'm convinced she can pull that off, and it absolutely not for everyone. And even beyond the length, I can't promise you'll enjoy it, but I sure as fuck did. 
This is special. But I gotta start off with the plot, framing, and themes of the album. Yes, there's gonna be some spoilers, although with some of the stuff I'm about to describe, I'm not sure the majority of you will actually believe what's happening. So, uh... Ethel Kane is the titular preacher's daughter, with a story set in the early 1990s in an extremely religious part of the Deep South. And if you've heard Inbred, or you just clued into some of what I've already described, you already know where this is going. You know the streak of religion and abuse of women that bleeds through and gets painfully vivid on songs like Hard Times. It's a trauma that underscores every relationship the protagonist has, and the string of relationships that follow in this wake. From the high school sweetheart that left her escapist dreams to fade to the swaggering bad boy where her entanglement in his mental illness and crimes leaves her ostracized from her church and her community to the good guy who offers to take her on a long eventually romantic seeming trip to California such a nice guy that even on their gorgeously romantic ballad thoroughfare it's made clear that veneer is being used to get what he wants. And the remaining half of the album shows the unbelievably bleak and grisly place he will take Ethel Kane to a graphic point that has to be heard to be believed. Honestly, if the atmosphere wasn't note perfect, I'd almost say it swivels into a point that's too edgy to be believed. The sort of exploitation scene you really can't come back from, and the juxtaposition on the final song will test it all to the limit. I'm still kind of stunned that Ethel Kane actually went there. And from all that, the album kicks off with this 80s inflected anthemic banger and an American teenager with a guitar progression that mirrors a segment from Journey's Don't Stop Believing with the Arpeggios. <laughs> yeah. If this is where I think Ethel Kane knocks this album out of the park, it probably becomes most in a masterclass of framing. Not just in the deeply held swells of aspirational Americana that wrap through every crevice of this album, but also the bone-deep knowledge that it's an American dream that not everyone can win. It's not designed for everyone to win, where the vast reverb-soaked production is used to accentuate the vast loneliness, the spaces that can feel both intoxicating but also intensely isolating. A major theme of this album is the cycle of generational trauma and how every step and attempt to escape it here goes horrifically wrong, where the term melodrama is completely valid because every choice the protagonist makes is driven on pure desperate emotion, but for a traumatized woman who is desperately straining for real love outside of the brutal hell that believes in a brutal heaven, it feels very emotionally true. So there is some old-fashioned glamour and a country romance to the scenes that Ethel Kane will paint with men who will then use and exploit her, but she's a reliable enough narrator in every song to highlight just how toxic it all really is, be it very much immediately on Western nights, or the slow build across the drugged-out nightmare that proceeds from thoroughfare into the second half of this album, which reaches its absolute most terrifying point on Ptolemaea, a reference to Dante's Inferno, and a layer of hell reserved for those who betray guests in their homes. If there is glamour, the song like Gibson Girl highlights just how much of it was drawn and traced by men for their own appetites, who proceed to pimp and abuse her even as she retreats behind a drugged out haze of autotune just to dissociate it from it all, try to maintain some vestige of sanity. And it's heartbreaking for a protagonist who yearns so deeply to be taken advantage of and consumed as she clings to a god that's not answering anything until a uh, sun bleach flies. Where instead of pulling from the words of a well-respected preacher and father figure who molested her to hit back harder, she finds forgiveness. She seeks peace. And yet, how much of her sacrifice is all worth when her good guy kills her and she looks on as if there is a very, uh, Catholic parallel in what he chooses to do to her body. At least she finds an element of peace and relief even despite the visceral gore of it all, where there's some actual stakes to the old ultra-violence that feels way too lived in and transgressive. Lana Del Rey would not dare to go to this place of sincerely brutal castigation of the lies of American fundamentalist Christianity and the systemic abuse it enables. To say nothing of the cannibalism. And yes, I know, it is tired to bring this up again, 
but I want to highlight why any comparison between the two feels so deeply wrong and lazy, especially when bad writers claim that one has already strip-mined the territory, which despite their assertions, Lana Del Rey has never originated nor owned. She may have de finally developed some disillusionment with the restrictive gender roles and toxic masculinity by the time we finally got to Norman fucking Rockwell, an album that, in my opinion, actually has worse pacing and momentum problems in comparison with the suffocating but dreamlike wandering of Preacher's Daughter, which you know, actually knows how to effectively use its negative space and build crescendos. But look, it was never built to seriously challenge those power structures. Lana Del Rey was privileged enough that when she got tired of the common people, she had an exit strategy, which allowed her melodrama to act as the retrograde fantasy, easy enough for her and the audience to disavow, even if it might be what she actually believes. Whereas there is a very real cost to the freedom and love that Ethel Kane seeks out, there are far fewer exit strategies, where the generational and historical weight of it all presses down on someone who is already very fragile. The cost of an easy disavowal is just not on the table, especially as often as she tries and fails to fully escape, so much of it being her own emotionality. And she has less power. This is not the morally ambiguous girl boss who can fuck her way to the top. This is more of a universal story, of being trapped amidst the violent patriarchal systems operating under the guise of righteousness in which she still desperately wants to believe. And while I won't say that Ethel Kane being a trans woman is a deliberate factor into the narrative, it does lead to some interesting bending of gender signifiers all across the album to add another level of moral complexity and matching with the body horror to add a different bite to some of its most visceral moments. It's actually really quite striking that added subtext. That being said, those who go into this album simply expecting slow core shock value or pure nightmare fuel beyond a couple of scattered moments you might be a bit underwhelmed. Preacher's Daughter is an extremely slow burn. It wants you to feel every inch of that expanse. And even then, some might consider the sheer amount of exploitation and abuse start feeling a little gratuitous. I would disagree with that assessment, mostly due to just how well Ethel Kane handles tone in her compositions and production. But for an album that can run very long, with two instrumental interludes back-to-back, -back, with August Underground immediately followed by Televangelism, the former a reference to a notorious 2001 exploitation film, the latter a fractured moment of religious performativity, I don't know, I can see where a certain exasperation might kick in, especially if the framing juxtaposition with the subject matter, start testing patience, or you don't take it seriously. Now for me, honestly a lot less of an issue. Mostly because the compositions and production actually took another leap, and the album feels so immense in its scope and its dramatic weight, it feels lived in and real. Ethel Kane once again produced this all herself, and well, I could nitpick and say that the synths on American Teenager and the horns on Sunbleached Flies, they aren't quite as well blended as they could be. That's me nitpicking. It's minor in the scope of both songs. Where the album might be saturated in reverb, but it never desaturates the melodies or the percussion or the quaking underlying groove. To say nothing of how she adds field recording textures to all of these songs to accentuate the wild, humid, windswept tableaus. I love how a house in Nebraska leans into the ponderous loneliness as the violin aches and the guitar roars over the haunted mix, accentuating her isolation as she yearns to be lost in the middle of nowhere. I love how the muted electric guitar squeals around the keys as the booming drum highlights that secret dread she knows is just out of frame on western nights. The stalking bassy blues that lets her cut loose and shred on family tree. Or just how she lets the gorgeous acoustic textures shape the utterly love-struck country tragedy of thoroughfare, just perfect Americana there. And while the most obvious bleak moment on the album comes with Ptolemaea and her bone-chilling scream to emphasize one particular moment, I have to draw attention to where the most bleak and kinda sick moments actually occur. How Hard Times is a soft focus bedroom pop country moment in major keys despite everything that takes place within it makes it feel almost like an Emily Scott Robinson song. To how the organs will swell up around the pianos, where the drums feel ever so slightly off on Sunbleach Flies falling off of Televangelism, and it feels like the best ballad that we never got from 1989. 
or how the closing track Strangers is one of the best dream country songs I have heard in years that knows the precise right moment to let the guitars just erupt and soar. And all of it is anchored in the sort of magnetic charisma and presence at this album's core with Ethel Kane's just stunning vocal arrangements. Be it spare and restrained to intensify that intimacy. Reminds me a lot of Ian No at his very darkest. Or, you know, overdubbed for a choral arrangement that is damn near symphonic. You could tell she came from the church. She's described Florence Welch as an influence, but I would argue Ethel Kane goes even even further with just so much tremendous power that so many peers in comparison just would never match. She goes for broke and she pulls it off. And look, I'll say it again, it's not for everyone. Preacher's Daughter is a sort of crushing, colossal album that if you buy in will put you through the emotional ringer. And maybe it's just my long lingering fondness for gothic swell infusing the dream country Americana and a woman who could take us to heaven and hell and back. But the writing is stripped down but poetic, making you feel every twisted turn of phrase focus on those fine details where it could have so easily come across as tryhard or forced or edgelord. And at least to me it never does. Melodramatic in its structure, sure, but this is exactly why I always say melodrama does not have to be a bad thing when it makes the most of the epic swell and climax, leaning into it and having something to say. And even then, I'd argue so much of the framing is morally complex in its exploration of generational trauma and both men and women crushed underfoot in chasing that dream where it demands you look hard at where you give sympathy, who you forgive, and who is actually worthy of grace? It's sinner get ready for Gen Z. And at least for me, I'd argue it might be better. This is one of the best albums of 2022, plain and simple. I would completely understand if you can't get into it. After everything I described, I wouldn't blame you. But if you can, it's something special. You should hear it. So yeah, uh, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I would be extremely grateful. I know I had a lot to say about this one, and yeah, there, this is a tough album to talk about. There's just a lot to it. It's a behemoth. It's gargantuan. It's crushing. And again, content warning felt appropriate, at least in my terms. But hey, anything else I may be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. If you've got comments, leave them down there below. And if you guys want to get involved in helping support the channel, link to my Patreon is right over there, where previously you would get the opportunity to put albums on my schedule, or hell, if you just want to argue with me in my Discord server, options are available. Now, before I go on any further, I want to highlight one quick thing coming up for the next couple of weeks. Given that I'm heading into the mid-year and I've got my regular mid-year list video that I'm putting together, I also have about... 30 albums I want to get to ahead of time and there's just no way with the way I normally structure on the pulse that I'll probably be able to do it. So what I'm going to do is temporarily put on the pulse on pause and I'm going to try a couple of the YouTube short structures for my normal quippy nature of discussing these albums. It'll force me to be a little bit more concise, a little bit more narrowed in my focus. If I have a longer form album review where I just have more to say, I will inevitably make that video. Of course I will. But you might see a lot more of the shorts coming out as I try to churn through all the albums I want to get to, be it in country, or in hip-hop, or in pop, or in metal, or in just the amount of weird shit that I've unfortunately stacked up really high behind me. If the shorts go well and take off in terms of views, I might continue on with it with On The Pulse, it leaving more in the back burner, because let's face it, On The Pulse just never gets the amount of hits and traffic to really justify the amount of work I put into it. It really sucks, but this will also allow a bit more of a focused experience. You want to hear me talk about a specific album? this will be the way to do it. You might see more uploads coming up, and I would understand if it might become overwhelming, but it's going to be an experiment I try to the mid-year. We're going to go with that. So I hope you guys stick around. I hope you guys, again, share these long-form videos. It's really important. But until then, I'm Mark. You're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.